building a mental fitness routine. If you haven't got one at the moment, you're probably going to want to put one together by the end of this episode. But it was my own experiences with severe depression and hypermania that made me realize in my early 20s that I didn't want to be a, uh, a banker. I didn't want to work in finance. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to try and stop someone else or more than just one person, hopefully, from having to go through the same depths of despair that I did. Greater communication with your family and friends, but also identifying maybe one or two people who you just have a regular check-in with, whether it's just once a, a month. And, you know, as a psychiatrist uh, working in the NHS, there is no blood test. There's no MRI scan. There's no uh, diagnostics tool that's going to tell you, Mike, or tell me, Nick, uh, what wellness routine, what, what I should do to look after my mind. Uh, the only way you can find that out through is is through trial and error and effective kind of analysis of that trial and error and working out, you know, what, what should I carry on doing? What's going on, people? Welcome back to another episode. If you're new here, I promise you, you're in the right place because you're going to get a lot of value and a lot of information from this episode. I had Nick Pryor on, who is the founder of Mindful.com, and he came on to talk about everything related to building a mental fitness routine. And it's a really interesting way of looking at things if you think about it, because you'd build yourself a normal fitness routine, you know, going on runs, lifting weights, yoga, swimming, all this sort of stuff. But following that thought process, but applying it to your own mind is a really powerful way of looking at things. So Nick came on to talk about not only establishing a mental fitness routine, but also all the activities that can feed into that. So, you know, breath work, cold exposure, getting out in nature, going on walks, mindful activities, all these sort of things. And he also is also a qualified psychiatrist. So we also touched on things like, you know, some of the driving forces behind our current state of mental health at the moment, and also the technology, the technology, the impact that technology might be having on us. So very insightful episode as always, very knowledgeable man. Get yourself a beverage, get yourself relaxed and take in everything that's about to be said, because I promise you, there's a lot of value to take home. Well, look, welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks a lot, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here today and to be talking about such an important topic. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, always like to kick things off, man, with just, you know, give us your story. Give us um, the life events that have kind of brought you up to where you are now. Um, you know, paint us all the full picture. Yeah, I mean, that it's uh, hard to know where to start, but I'll, I'll try and give that a go. But I think uh, for most people, it, it's a very complex story trying to understand what it is that motivates us in this moment today and i think for the vast majority of us that's a combination of what we've experienced through our mind and bodies i mean that's how we interact with the world um for me it's the mind has been the most important part and i think really from a probably a biased point of view it's the mind that tells the body how to behave as well so that it's really we have to start with the mind um in my case uh, there's a strong family history of mental illness. Uh, my my grandmother, who I never got to met to meet, uh, sadly uh, committed suicide and had a long history of of depression. Uh, ended up kind of being admitted to hospital, was treated with ECT. Back in a day when mental health was really not understood and the stigma was even much much worse than it is today. Um, mm. My mother has a diagnosis of bipolar, and I always use she's happy for me to use the phrase that you know she's pretty lucky to be alive to be honest um okay. and i've also got a diagnosis of bipolar but and i've struggled with depression and i've been suicidal at times but it's never quite quite got to the same level of crisis or extremity that that, that it has with my mother or my grandmother and uh for me it's those um personal experiences that have really motivated kind of my 20s and early 30s uh, uh prior to that i was much more kind of driven by money, driven by the kind of normal motifs of probably the the general populace as a whole. Um, but it was my own experiences with severe depression and hypermania that made me realize in my early 20s that I didn't want to be a, uh, a banker. I didn't want to work in finance. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to try and stop someone else or more than just one person, hopefully, from having to go through the same depths of despair that I did. Um, and that's what's really motivated me ever since. Um, I've, that hasn't stopped my mental health problems, but through that journey, it's probably helped 
prevent kind of some of the more extreme sides of it. And through that, this process over the last 10 years, I've trained as a doctor. I work, worked as a psychiatrist and I set up a mental wellness platform called Mindful that is focused on prevention. So that's a very um, brief but hopefully informative um, overview of, of what motivates me and why your podcast, I think, is so important. And, you know, there are lots of specifics we can go into around kind of, you know, the differences between genders and, and why certain uh, people are more prone to suicide or prone to not asking for help. Um, I'm happy to talk about anything, to be honest, and I'll be guided by you, Mike. You know, you've spoken to lots of interesting people. So, you know, just, just probe wherever you want. I, I can, I'm happy to go anywhere. Yeah, for sure, man, for sure. Well, um, first and foremost, mate, very relatable story in the sense of kind of your motivation for things. Um, you know, the whole reason I started this podcast was after some experiences with anxiety that I went through, it was very much a case of, you know, even if just one person can be helped, um, who's going through that at the moment, then that's a big enough reason to start this podcast. So very inspiring stuff, man. Um, something that I wanted to ask you about was kind of taking us back to when you first sort of went through, um, sort of when you were diagnosed with bipolar. Um, um, from listening on another podcast, I remember you were in your early twenties, I believe. Um, so tell tell us more about that experience and what it was like as a, as a young man sort of going through that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that stage, uh, hadn't been formally diagnosed as bipolar. It was, you know, the first episode was in my kind of, what year was it? Probably my second year of university. Um, you can create a, a narrative around any moment. And I think, you know, at the time my parents were separating, I was away from home. Um, I'd been a kind of country boy growing up in quite a small little bubble. I'd moved to London for university. And I think in my mind, it was, um, I suppose in a depressive mind anyway, it was, it was all my fault. And I think that's what's, you know, what it doesn't really matter how, what the narrative is or, um, for the individual, but generally a depressive mind makes you hypercritical and, and kind of losing that sense of self-belief that actually the vast majority of the world hold on to even if they're having a shit day they will probably at some point during that week brighten up and they'll have a nice conversation with someone and it will feel natural and intuitive and enjoyable and it's when that doesn't happen for a couple of weeks you know formally that's when the diagnosis point comes from a psychiatric point of view but really probably months before that kind of low slide into depression starts to impact your daily life. And for me, it was, yeah, the amount of shame is a very natural part of uh, element of depression for a lot of people. Uh, it is this kind of inner critic of, you know, people describe, and for me, certainly it's this constant kind of parrot on the side of your, on your shoulder saying how shit you are and how terrible you are. And you have this, most people have an ability to mask that for a while. They know in, innately that they've been behaving a certain way for the last 20 years of their lives. And therefore, let's just try and ignore that parrot. But it becomes stronger and stronger and it becomes a vicious cycle of, you know, lack of motivation, lack of energy, lack of interest in things that can slowly but surely then actually mean that it, it does impact your life. You are doing less than you were doing before. You're not calling your friends. You're not calling your loved ones. And then actually you've got real proof of what a failure you are. And then it, then it cycles on. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, I think it was, I think last point for me, the, the important part is also I was very fortunate, you know, in some, in a weird way that my family had experienced mental illness before. We're pretty um, well informed and understood the space. And yet um, I still couldn't um, feel like I could access their support um, when I was particularly, when I was very unwell. And that wouldn't just be for the first episode, that would be for the next kind of, three or four or actually I, don't, I think ultimately it's um when you really go low you're 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 never going to be able to it's all about prevention from my point of view and you need to catch it early and that's kind of a lot of what I spend my time trying to advocate I'm with you I'm with you so tell, tell me more about what that process looks like like prevention um is that just looking for specific triggers that you know, you can say, oh, okay, we're on the verge here of potentially, you know, going down a spiral. 
and then realizing what those triggers are and doing all you can to prevent them happening. Yeah, so I think it, it, it's very complex and as ever, it's, you know, every mind for their own and you have to find your own way. And that's a strong something I believe in very strongly. But there are some common kind of ground rules um, which don't apply to everyone. But I think a, a, a useful saying, I mean, just to start with, I mean, you um, bravely shared that you've experienced anxiety before. And one of the, the first things I always say as a little mantra to try and remind people about this is, you know, if you're depressed, um, you don't think you deserve help. If you're anxious, you're too scared to ask for help. And if you're psychotic, you don't think you need help. So by the time you're ill, you're probably yeah, well, okay. very unlikely to be asking for help. So really often, you know, that first crisis point is the first opportunity for real recovery because it will be that first presentation to a &E, that first kind of breakdown at home where actually your parents recognize that there's something much worse going on here or whatever that moment is for you, that crisis point or in the kind of um, addiction space, what you would call a turning point, um, is often the first step to recovery. And uh, it's during that recovery, I think, where you felt the real difficulties and pain of the, that mental disorder, that illness, that you can then actually invest in those preventative measures. Um, and I think the, you know, from my point of view, it, it, a lot of it is about communication with loved ones. And it depends, obviously, if you've got a network and support. But I think the communication piece is really important. So normally during that tough time, not that your relatives might not have really appreciated what you've been going through, but they will have recognized that something difficult has happened. And I think if you can try and uh, open up to them, not totally like vulnerable, you know, open yourself in a vulnerable way, but not, you don't have to show the 100 percent of it because yeah. everyone has different expectations and different understandings of, of the world so i think what i would say is is that the trying to create um greater communication with your family and friends but also identifying maybe one or two people who you just have a regular check-in with whether it's just once a, a month where you and there are some amazing tools online so around mood for example there's moodscope.com a free service that allows you to in about 20 seconds score your mood quite objectively and you can tie that to a buddy system so you can say two of oh, your best okay. mates can be part of that and it will automatically once you submit a, a, a score send them your score and then it's up to them to decide well based on that score do i need to send them a message or not but it that those are the type of things that are really good and then i think as you get better and in investing in and looking after your mind you'll also um, get better at also recognizing the kind of daily activities that that kind of keep you stable and happy and that can be really broad from whether it's kind of sitting down at the end of the day and watching an episode of friends whether it's making yourself a really nice cup of coffee at lunchtime and having a half an hour walk during your working day or it could be doing some really kind of cold immersion kind of thermal shocks like whether that's yeah, a hot yeah, bath yeah. at home or whatever there's hundreds of different things that we all do without realizing it. And I think the more we can do those types of things, um, the more sustainable and longer term you can look after your mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess that's where something like journaling would come in really, isn't it? Kind of just absolutely. Like journaling down how everything makes you feel that you do each day. Mm. Um, both, both, both for good and bad things. Like I've found that like journaling, all the habits that I do say, like, I know that if I have a heavy night on the beers, like I'm going to be anxious the next day. And like, it wasn't really until I was just writing down everything that I was doing. And I was like, oh my God, now that I see this written down on paper, like I can realize that this habit is triggering this anxiety. Um, that's just one Absolutely. example. Like, for example, if I don't get like, um, you know, more than six hours sleep, um, I know that I'm probably going to feel a little bit, you know, not as good the next day. Yeah, and I think what's difficult is is often, you know, the types of things you're relating to there sound quite simple, so we don't actually invest enough time in them. They're not given the the kind of marketing spend or the kind of branding uh, that's required, yeah. and so we are distracted by all these activities that actually make us feel more stressed, or, uh, whether that's, you know, some forms of social media, um, the kind of the consumer-obsessed world that we live in where we're constantly comparing ourselves to people who um are presenting just a very small part of themselves um so 
yeah, for me, it's it's journaling is a wonderful habit, and that's one of the activities we promote on on Mindful. And I think the journaling is really, like you say, is a reflective tool. It's an ability for you to identify what's working and what's not. Um, and it's also, you know, it's an empowering tool as well. It's basically taking responsibility and saying, I'm going to to kind of look into this um, in a gentle way. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a massive fan of journaling. I do it, um, you know, to different degrees at different times in my life. Um, but I think it's something that, that can stick, you know, is, is, is useful at any point in your life. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Just want to uh, loop back quickly to something that you said then about kind of the world that we live in at the moment, this, this constant comparison that's going on, this, you know, consumer sort of uh, economy that we're living in, like, as a psychiatrist, one of the questions I really wanted to ask you about was like, what do you think some of the driving forces behind our current state of mental health is at the moment? Um, and I feel like maybe you just sort of touched on a couple then. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a burning question and it's a hugely important. I mean, I think I think just a general kind of premise or something which I start off with always around this kind of discussion is the the fact that, you know, the brain has evolved over millions of years and it's it really hasn't changed though very much you know given the time scale in the last 10,000 years and yet the change in which the way in which we're living has has been immense I mean if you were to compare the the daily life of someone in even in kind of the bronze age relative to today uh, it would be yeah. completely different the demands on our mind would be completely different the expectations upon us would be totally different. And I think that that's just a very general rule to be like, well, actually, it kind of makes sense that the mind is struggling in, in today's age. Um, if we look more closely at, at what's going on today, uh, there are, you know, lots of factors. But I think the for me, overall, it is this, you brought it up around the comparison piece, but also the over communication piece for me is a big point as well. We don't really allow ourselves in the modern world to rest and to enjoy rest and if we are resting then there's in some societies anyway there seems to be an obsession with actually making the rest count so we have to prove that we're we're, in, we're having the best holiday ever so yeah. the chance to yeah. to relax and in, engage in a in a, a social format that we would have been used to back on the savannah in a tribal kind of environment where you've got 40 or 50 people who you totally trust all different ages all supporting each other you know that that just doesn't exist anymore so the truth so the problem is is that because it's so complex trying to there are so many factors or factorials coming in definitively it's been very hard to say this is the key problem uh there's been lots of indicators in the research to suggest things like social media particularly social media like instagram that focuses on the individual and representation of oneself are negative but there's no definitive link to kind of social media being uh, causing depression at the moment. There's no real, really deep research proving that. Okay. A lot of us feel that that probably makes sense and there is a theory around it and it, it's pointing that way, but we don't know definitively. But I think this is why really ultimately the, the journaling that you were talking about or what we're trying to do at Mindful is, you know, you've got to go on that journey yourself and you've got to work out what works for you. It's not up yeah. to you just to say, well, social media, these Facebook and Instagram have got to be accountable. Now, there is a degree of accountability, but ultimately, we know they're not going to make those changes in the next 10, 20 years. So mm -hmm. you've mm -hmm. got to make the changes yourself. You've got to be accountable to yourself and you've got to realize, actually, after an hour of Instagram, how do I feel? Um, and maybe yeah. I make that yeah. point in my journaling. And then I say, actually, well, maybe after 30 minutes of watching Friends before bed, I not only felt better after it, but I actually slept better as well. And the closer, the more we can analyze in a gentle kind of practical way, um, kind of what works for our minds, our individual minds, the better. That's kind of my um, philosophy. Ah, mate, I'm 100% on board with that. I think it was really well put. And um, it, it sounds to me like based off what you said then with like, you know, back in the day, we used to, you know, this, this sort of like tribe, community around us you've got trust you've got people of all ages and like you say that doesn't really exist anymore um so it sounds like not necessarily the one size fits all antidote for curing mental health completely but i think 
something that would help us definitely get somewhere is seeking out those connections more um, rather than, you know, not to, not to put it the wrong way, but like trying to seek these connections through a phone screen, which I feel like is kind of like what, what we're doing day in, day out, to be honest with you at the moment. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's really difficult at the moment because most of our attention spans are, you know, on our phones, you know, if you're trying to you know, make innovation, or you're trying to influence society, you kind of have to start on tech. And we, we've really thought quite long and hard about that, uh, mindful about how we find strike that right balance. And, you know, we, you know, much earlier stage in Facebook or Instagram or these big social media companies, but we have very strong values about making sure that there's always a fulfillment cycle involved in the interaction with mindful. So we provide an app that has content to inspire and motivate you to go and do something in the real world. The ultimate goal is to always uh, push people back into the real world and do something yeah. for themselves. Um, whereas if you look at most of the social media platforms, uh, it's a constant dopamine cycle of, of seeking. You're constantly seeking that next moment of dopamine rush. There's no pushing you back into the real world. So I personally think there is a responsibility for people who are interested in social media, social impact and, and um, mental health or health tech or whatever to, to accept that that is where people's attentions are right now. And there is something that we can do of value there, but it has to end up as the end goal being about empowering people to look after their own minds and their own world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, it, it's something I struggle with myself as well, obviously, you know, the, to get more listeners on the podcast, you know, you've, you've got to get on social media and promote the thing. And, you know, I just try and make sure that the entire page is just nothing but knowledge for people, quick snippets of knowledge that's going to improve their lives in some way, shape or form. Um, because I just, you know, I, I have no interest in be like, you know, I hate the term influencer personally, um, probably because of the sort of characters that are attached to that, that word, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in, the, in, in the world we, that we live in, in the moment. But yeah, I agree, man. I think it's just a case of just helping people as much as possible on social media. Um, versus, yeah. you know, I mean, we've all done it in the past, you know, I've, I've definitely been guilty when I was younger of making my life seem more enjoyable than maybe it was at the time. Um, so I think if we can just try and step a little bit away from that, and just focus on the helping aspect a bit more. Yeah, and I I think there is a natural intrinsic like we shouldn't beat ourselves up about kind of you know there's a evolutionary need and desire to present ourselves as best as we can from whether it's trying to attract a mate or whether it's trying to kind of influence your tribe or whatever whatever it may be. But I think mm -hmm. the it's just the extremities to which it's been taken. And I think you know also like the word influencer could easily be the word inspirer but but it it's because you know influencer sounds because of like you say the context in which the words come about it sounds incredibly mercenary doesn't it it's like you're yeah. um whereas if someone says you're an inspirer you know that that does that feels very different but actually the the meaning is probably the same yeah yeah i'm with you i'm with you i'm with you um something i mean you've you've sort of mentioned mindful sort of here and there so far in the conversation um I want you to give me in the audience a, com a complete breakdown, man, of, of what it's all about. Yeah, so um, Mindful started two, two and a half, well, probably two and a half years ago now. Uh, it's founded uh, by myself and my brother-in-law, both of whom live with bipolar. Uh, we've worked in very different spaces. Uh, I've been a, ended up being a psychiatrist and also have a bit of a commercial background, having worked... Um, for KPMG, a big professional services company, before I made that move into into medicine, uh, and then James, uh, my brother-in-law, he uh, has been much more of a creative. Uh, he's worked in advertising, uh, kind of some of the big advertising houses in London, and we've kind of tried to merge those two minds. So my kind of more practical, uh, scientific, kind of rigorous approach with James is more well. Actually, let's make this. Uh, attractive enough and interesting enough for someone to actually use it uh, and that's kind of been the sweet spot for us and we're kind of obsessed with trying to help people discover their own 
wellness routine. So we'll offer hundreds of different activities that are good for the mind. We'll condense them. We'll get really inspiring people to talk about them. And we'll try and turn that idea into an action when we send people back into the real world. And then ideally, we'll get a bit of social proof to show that they've done it. So a photo or a video record or a voice recording. And then they'll get a badge a bit like the scouts or the guides. So they'll get a badge saying you, you've now got the wild swimming badge. You've now got the cold shower badge. You've got the volunteering badge. Uh, you've got the doodling badge. You've got the knitting badge. Those are just a few of the things that we will recommend because there are so many, or you've got the uh, urban walks badge, whatever it might be. You can have yeah. um, a look on our, on our app, but the, the overall premise from a kind of more science, because I before I did medicine, actually, I did a physics degree. So I'm also quite numbers orientated. And basically, the by offering 100 different um, ideas, um, if people try just 10 of them and collect four or six of them, you end up with billions of permutation combinations that people can go on because of the, the number that you start with. So what that means is that we can genuinely help people go on that trial and error process for themselves. So what we were talking about earlier around, you know, that being kind of what gets me excited is, or what, what works is, is testing your own mind in the real world that we're trying to channel that very core premise into a usable consumable app. And uh, I think the, you know, the last point to make there is, is that from a, from a trial and error process, you know, it is just, you know, important to state, you know, what, what, what works for you, Mike, is going to be very different for what works for me. We might have a couple of activities yeah. or type of things that overlap, but, you know, you're not going to know until you try. And, you know, as a psychiatrist uh, working in the NHS, there is no blood test. There's no MRI scan. There's no uh, diagnostics tool that's going to tell you, Mike, or tell me, Nick, uh, what wellness routine, what, what I should do to look after my mind. Uh, the only way you can find that out through is is through trial and error and effective kind of analysis of that trial and error and working out you know what sh what should I carry on doing and journaling is obviously a very good part of that that's why we have a scrapbook within the app to allow you to kind of make voice notes to record any pictures and and to record your mood at different points in time to try and help you with that journaling process. Amazing. I, mate, it's genius. I absolutely love the whole concept. And I think, like, I'm I'm definitely guilty of doing this in the past, whereby, you know, like, I'll tell, like, everyone they need to do meditation. I'm like, you got to do it. Like, and, you know, just because it works for me doesn't mean that it's going to work for one of my mates, you know? Um, yeah. I, I think, especially with online as well, um, it can be very easy to fall into that trap of, like, this is a one-size-fits-all approach. If you suffer with anxiety, you know, meditation is the go-to. Whereas, like you said, that isn't always the case. Yeah, and I think that's something I've experienced a lot as a psychiatrist because often it is that kind of um, hierarchy of kind of top-down, like, do what I say um, approach. And there isn't really the – the NHS isn't set up to provide that freedom and that empowerment for the, the end user. Um, I also interesting that you brought meditation up. Like, look, I, I love meditation. I do quite a lot of breath work or whatever you want to term it myself. It help, It's one of the quickest and easiest ways to – to take back a bit of control and to kind of modulate your sympathetic and, and parasympathetic nervous system. It's brilliant, but also it, it comes with its own um, stigma. And actually only about if you, even if you provide the best kind of top level provision of kind of, of meditation and you train people up, whatever, only about the retention rate will only be around 15, 20%. Like it's not, it's not for everyone. Yeah. Um, and and that that's always been the premise also from the James and I has been we don't also we also have always found the wellness space quite off putting it's quite uh zen like it's kind of um people doing kind of yoga lotus poses in some beautiful beach with whale noises and yeah. you know like i i don't have a problem with that but it also it we we really wanted to create an offering that didn't put you know James and I off, I suppose, to a degree yeah. as well, and wasn't yeah, just yeah. for that subsection. You know, that there is probably the one size fits all solution for five percent who will love that kind of offering, but we need to to open that up to and that to the wider audience. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's what it's about, I guess, is like translating what someone might be getting from doing that experience, like you say, yoga on the beach with wild noises, and 
um, being able to sprinkle sprinkle that into modern society and be like, okay, you know, it's like when again looping back to meditation, people's like perception of it is that I get in a, a monk's robe and go and sit in like sit in the forest for an hour, and it's like trying to explain to people, no nah, man, like this is very accessible. You can do it from your own home. Um, yeah. And I think that's why I actually tend to, I mean, obviously there's a slight distinction and I, I'm not sure I actually know what it is, but there is, but, but I tend to call it breath work. And I, that for me is more of a practical way of describing it. And it's like, how do I, and for me, whenever I do breath work or meditation, it's, it's just about uh, focusing on kind of my, how long I can hold or, or let go inhale and exhale and try and slow down my res respirate basically, because from a physiological point of view or from a doctor's point of view, it's bloody remarkable that we yeah. have that control over our breath. Like you can't tell your heart rate to drop by um, half just by telling it, you know, like yeah. the breath, the breath is a real like connection with our innermost physiology. And there is something really powerful there, but it, that I get really frustrated with the way that it's being kind of wrapped up and made into this kind of quite elitist um, and kind of inaccessible kind of offering for mo for the majority of the population yeah 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 so are you, I'm, I'm assuming you're familiar with wim hof yeah 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 so i mean what do you think about his approach with everything man yeah so i mean i i love what he's done i particularly love more of his early work i mean the, the stuff he's done recently i found um a bit frustrating but i won't focus on that but 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 i think it's kind of he in some ways has kind of, I think, copped out a little bit and dumbed it down a bit. And and yes, it's made it much more accessible and it's been an amazing kind of from a publicity point of view. But I think it's also oversimplified uh, what he's actually um, offering. But fundamentally, yeah, I mean, cold water swimming uh, has been something that has been used for, you know, thousands of years. Um, thermal shock, whether it's really cold water or really hot water or any which way you can go to a really cold state to a hot state has been used for a long time. I mean, when when people were in the asylums in, in America kind of 200, 300 years ago, uh, there were uh, five main ways in which they um, tried to treat the most incurable cases. And uh, one of them was with cold, cold water. Uh, one of them was with uh, putting people in very hot environments. Even, for example, they would give people um, malaria to try and provoke a very high fever to help with um, mental illness. There was uh, putting people into hypoglycemic um, uh, comas. So they would give people iodine, uh, not iodine, uh, insulin. And then Jesus. there was, and then the last one was ECT, which was, um, they trialed. And actually, the reason I bring this up is, is it's interesting. Yet again, it's a very extreme example of trial and error. Um, but the two ones which came out most out of and there's, sadly, a lot of people would have gone gone through a lot of very difficult times because of that. But yeah. the advancement of that did mean that, you know, we have learned quite a lot about cold water. And we have also learned a lot about ECT as well, which that's probably another whole topic. Um, but I think the with, with um, Wim Hof, uh, I think it's been, yeah, from my point of view, it's a he has until this slight cop out i think was it on itv or where's he done it recently i was watching yeah, i think prior to that I think BBC, man. it's bbc it was, yeah prior yeah, to that yeah, he'd yeah. done an amazing job of making um kind of the power of of cold water and kind of some discipline and and focus and breathing all in one go really like i think i bet he's in, he's inspired and motivated hundreds of thousands of people to do it um during his career and that is an amazing achievement um just to, it's just the recent bbc series that um i couldn't watch it all because it kind of annoyed me a bit the way they presented it but prior to that i'm i'm still an absolute believer we um uh, we do a little we do a pilot project at the moment in northampton um and we work with a a, a um well-being um site called soul haven and their most popular class at the moment is just they so they just fill up loads of ice buckets with wheelie bins and they get um, a kind of instructor around, and they get twenty people to do it. And I've nice. seen, I've been, um, and I've seen some of the people who've done it. And I see these are not people who would normally be doing this activity. But I think because of yeah. Wim Hof and because of the excitement around it, and you know, I don't know if you've ever done it yourself, but I, I often go um, in. There's some 
ponds in central London that are open throughout the winter. And um, I, a couple of times when I was severely depressed, I would go, that was the one thing that would, I was like, if I've got to keep trying and that would make, even if I did nothing for the rest of the day, if I just got in that water for a minute and got out, at least I could say to myself or to my own inner critic, like, well, I did get into that ice water. And um, I, in those moments, I wouldn't get a sudden buzz of excitement, but it was a sense of achievement. But, you know, when I'm feeling more upbeat and energized, the there is an immediate dopamine rush and serotonin oh, there is. hit there is. from it. So have you ever done it before? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the cold showers. Um, in terms of, like, getting into, like, some wild water, maybe, like, once or twice, I'm trying to think where it was. Maybe in, like, Australia which there's, you know, there's colder climates. <laughs> I could have done it into be fair, mate. But, um, but uh, yeah, well, man, it, even with just... Sorry, go on. Sorry, Mike, sorry. Um, I think the cold showers is the best one because actually that's something that you can, you have so much more control over and it, it's something that you can put into your daily routine more easily. So that that for me is, is on my in my top five out of our activities. And I won't do it all year, but it's just, and I think this is another important point is, is that your wellness routine will change with your time of life. You know, am I going out on the, a bender every couple of days with, with my mates because I'm still at kind of college or university or or am I now like I am a, a, a responsible adult with uh, who's married and got a, a daughter? Um, yeah. And, you know, that comes with with other stresses and other lack lack of sleep. But I think the you know your wellness routine needs to adapt kind of with you as you go on so just because you've found your two or three activities or whatever it might yeah. be or your half dozen activities that doesn't mean you have you don't stop working on it i suppose yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and that that is something i wanted to ask you to be fair is like at the moment what is your current sort of wellness routine looking like like have you got daily things that you stick to as a ritual yeah yeah so i mean for for me, it, it, it's slightly different, but I think in the, in this context of this podcast, it's worth saying, like, because I have a diagnosis of bipolar, my wellness routine, and it is part of my wellness routine, requires, you know, I am on regular medication, um, you know, relatively heavy medication. You know, I'm on the likes of, you know, lift, lithium, quetiapine, venlafaxine, and, um, you know, that takes certain management around also whether how I, you know, drink alcohol with those medications, the impact on my sleep. Yeah. Um, those type of things, but that's a huge part of my wellness routine is being on my medication regularly. And you know, look, it's case by case, but for me, it's been very important. Um, from a kind of psychology point of view, I've done quite a lot of uh, therapy in the past. I've done a few few kind of rounds of CBT, and I've for a year or two, when I was particularly unwell, I would have kind of one to one therapy. I'm not on any therapy at the moment, but that's something I always keep that door open for. You know, if I need yeah. to come across that again. And then there's kind of the, the bigger space, which is kind of one, it's very important to me from because of my bipolar, but also it's relevant to everyone, wh whether you have a mental illness or not. And and so, yeah, so for me at the, at the moment, and I mean, they're not always like, yeah, again, this doesn't sound that exciting, but for me, um, thermal shock of some sort is there. So in the middle of winter, I always have literally a 45 minute bath, um, hot, hot bath where I get in, get in there just to the point where I can get in. And then I just keep adding hot until I feel like I'm almost cooked. And whilst I'm in there, I will just put on what I call my breath work, which is just a constant um, breathing rate of around kind of every, I think it ends up, I get my breath rate down to like four or five breaths per minute. And I'll do that for 10 minutes. And that was what I'll do yeah. in the winter. Right now I'm doing cold showers. Uh, and if I can, I'll get to the Lido, but something around, Thermal shocks and temperature is really important to me. Uh, and then it's actually some of these more kind of repetitive, kind of mindful tasks around kind of uh, we're lucky enough to have a small garden. So just weeding um, in the evenings this time of year is is really beneficial to me. Um, going out um, for an urban walk, but with a very much a focus on trying to find things that are beautiful, trying to find those kind of odd cracks in the in the concrete or a beautiful flower. Or whatever and then there are some things which i can't do every day but um are, for me are really important so i try and get out of london once a month into the kind of the proper countryside with a pair of binoculars as well um 
And this is something that I've only taken up because of what we're doing at Mindful. We've we've done a series on bird watching. We've had some really inspiring people talk about it. And now I'm just, nice. I, I, I used to have no idea. I used to kind of, I'm afraid to say, look down a little bit upon the Twitchers who were walking around with all their, all their gear. But now I totally <laughs> get it. And I think the, the, those are just a nice few. Man. But, but I think um, we can all find those few things. And I think the big thing is, is that we just do not, I know that I don't invest enough time in it and I'm living this world. But I know that the mm-hmm. majority of the population are doing probably 10, 20% of what they could be doing for their, for their minds in, in these kind of daily activities that, you know, do, doodling is another one that I just, I just do all the time. So even if I'm in a really important yeah. meeting, you'll, you'll look at my page at the end of it and half of it will be doodling. I mean, even right now, it's not a very good example. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, uh, there's some doodling yeah. on there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah, nice. Nice, like, nice, nice. And, and do, anyone can do doodling, you know, and we, you know, so that, yeah, there's lots of things, but those are my kind of top top ones for me. Nice, man. Nice. I think so. A couple of things I want to ask you about that. First and foremost, can I ask you, Mike, when you doing what, the activities? Do you, can I ask you if you've you've got Sorry, a top few? Man. Do you have a top few? Yeah, man. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the moment, it's um, meditation without question. Every day is a must. Um, if I can, it will be Wim Hof breathing. Um, I've, I'm, I'm experimenting at the moment with my breathing. Like I find that when I do it right before I go to sleep, I have an incredible sleep, which makes mm-hmm. me feel obviously pretty good the next day, but then also doing it first thing as well. Um, because as you know, your adrenaline is just through the roof, comes back down and then stressful situations throughout the day then are just so much easier to handle. So I'm experimenting with my Wim Hof at the moment. Um, to be honest with you, doing it both morning and night. <laughs> um yeah what else what else i'm i'm also as of today which this has only been a one day one day trial on this but <laughs> i'm uh I'm, I'm dialing in on my screen time man a lot with my phone um yeah because you know i i've just noticed like the correlation is just unmissable between my mood and the amount of time i spent on my phone and if you know if I'm if I'm sat there, sometimes maybe it's like four hours. It will be screen time. I know that at the end of that day, I'm probably going to have trouble sleeping. I know that I'm going to feel more stressed than usual. Um, so really dialing in on my screen time at the moment is something that's a massive priority for me. And I'm trying to because uh, like I'm posting content pretty much like every day. I'm making sure that the only time I'm really going on the apps is to post that content, reply to any DMs and comments, and then you know. I don't go on it then yeah. until until the next day. So that's that's something that's really high on my on my list of priorities at the moment. And it, it's funny because you know you, you have that sort of like that habitual reaction where like I'll be because I'm I'll put my phone in like a, a different room for example, and I'll be sort of typing away doing work and whatever. And then you have that you know my hand goes to reach for the for the phone and it's not there. Do you know what I mean? And I think I think God, how many times throughout the day do I actually instead of directly, you know, focusing on a task or directly trying to think about something that maybe I'm pushing to the back of my mind, how many times do I distract myself? Um, and I feel like the number's quite high. So, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think, it, yeah. It, it, and, it's and really interesting. Yeah, that, that what you just said, the word habitual just kind of shone out at me. And I think the, I'm just the same and I have to be quite disciplined, but I'm not doing enough. And we do have actually a, a, a series on digital detox. It's something that we think about a lot. So even on our, the majority of our content we deliver is via audio so that people can, though they are consuming content, they can still engage in, in the real world at the same time. Uh, but I think the, from the, you know, I, I don't know if I should bit this on a podcast, but you know, like even going to the, if I go to the loo to sit down to go to the loo for number two, I, I will check whether <laughs> I've got my phone on me before I go and sit down. Cause I don't want to waste two yeah. or three minutes yeah. off yeah. my phone and i think that yeah. is pretty shocking um but it's a true yeah. and uh yeah. yeah so uh yeah it's a huge one and i think yeah i'm glad you brought that one up because that everyone can well certainly our generation anyway can can do more on that on that front yeah 100 percent. And I, I just think like sometimes man when it is like say it's three and a half hours four hours in a day 
I'm like the things I could have done with that time. Like, like mm. you just, you're so in, you're so unconscious of, of those minutes racking up. I'm like, the, I could have done with that four hours today, <laughs> like, so, like so badly. Um, yeah. And 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 yeah, like you say, um, going to do certain things and making sure I've got my phone, whether it's you know going to the toilet or like, if something that I'm guilty of doing a lot, which I'm trying to get away from doing, and it links back to what you said about going on a walk and looking for something like you know a nice flower or just taking in the scenery around you, being mindful in that moment. Something I'm trying to get away from doing is constantly feeling the need to have music if I'm leaving the house. Like mm. I'll, I'll always, like I can't leave the house without a pair of headphones, even if I'm going, like I can basically see Aldi from my bedroom window. It's like a minute and a half walk. But I'm like, if I'm going to Aldi for, for some shopping, it's like, no, I need something, something in the background to keep me going, just, you know, a couple yeah. of songs and whatever. And I'm trying to get away from that because that's an opportunity for me to be mindful and present. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah. And I think, you know, we all, we can all find there are a lot of inches around the board and, you know, that's why we also like, if it's not a one size fits all solution or if it's not a silver bullet, for example, where, you know, like med meditation, I think both you and I can agree meditation has been really beneficial to us, but that's, that doesn't solve all our problems. And I think, uh, it's funny increments across the board, but and I think this digital detox one is another really interesting one. Or, or trying to reduce screen time is like we 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 recognise. Uh, well, I think you and I do, Mike. Please correct me if I'm wrong. That like we are going to continue to use our phones. We are going to continue to engage in the modern world. Yeah. Like we're not going to go yeah. into we're not going to become hermits. I mean, some a very small proportion of society might do that, and that's fantastic and and great for them. But is how do we capture the best of modern society or the, the and, and you and you and without jeopardizing our our mental health and our mental wellness and the balance doesn't feel quite right now and i mean a lot of that goes back to what we started with originally is given the rate of change you know there's bound to be a correction and things have kind of gone a bit warped it's like a sinusoidal curve like it will gently and we've just got to keep making sure that we're we're making working back to that equilibrium um I mean, if that as a metaphor, I don't know if that that me helps at all. But yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. Something that you've just actually, I didn't even think of this question to ask you, but something that you've just sort of triggered in my mind. Obviously, you mentioned now, you know, you've got a two year old and and whatnot. What's your approach going to be with technology around raising your child? Yeah, big big question. Um, <laughs> so for me. Um, I think most parents, it's interesting, I think when you, because we, we're kind of surrounding ourselves with, with kind of parents of similar chain age children at the moment. And there tends to be an intrinsic kind of uh, more vigorous or visceral reaction against tech for their children than for themselves. And, 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 and you know, for perfectly good reasons, because potentially the children's kind of, they're going through a much greater stage of development and, and growth and, um, so I, I tend to be on that side. I mean, I think I've, I suppose the best way to say it, uh, to express it in terms of how I how it, I perceive it and how important it is to me is, is that um, I've set kind of like a goal to leave um, London and be in the countryside by the time my eldest is five. So in three years time. And that's for lots oh, of other reasons nice. as well, probably. But I think there is a it feels like I think in big cities in particular, there's a kind of this pressure cooker of, of even more kind of competition, even more comparison, even more. And, and, and yeah, I, yeah. I, there is like a, a, a very, and so this isn't really because of my doctoring background or, or um, my professional experience. It's more uh, my, um, I have quite a visceral feeling that I don't want my, I want to try and limit that if I can. I suppose um, I don't, I mean, having actually seen quite a lot of children in practice um, who are a bit older through like cousins and older and actually in my, my work as well. So I worked in children, adolescent mental health services just last year, but the, the actually, yeah, again, it's very difficult. There are so many factors going on, but overall, like we, we can see some r rough trends around tech. And I think, but it's not clear enough yet. But I think the general rule from a kind of more professional point of view is, is the extremes are never 
like very good in the in these kind of spaces. So yeah. if you can somehow moderate the way in which your tri- child's behaving with tech so that they go down from watching three hours a day to to two hours a day, do that. Uh, but don't kind of turn your relationship with your child into an abs- a battleground for a year or two just because yeah. because there, I've seen many children who've watched lots of who's had a very high levels of screen time and they've had it turned out wonderfully and 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 actually so so sorry that's not a very good answer but basically um i'm probably more on the the kind of uh my my visceral personal experiences i don't i want to try and limit it as as kind of much as feasible but but actually in practice in in my work i have been surprised at how little it has affected some children who've had very extreme kind of screen time experiences. That's interesting. That's interesting. It's actually the first time I've kind of heard that, to be fair, because, uh, you know, a lot of the time you just hear um, some of these insane screen times and, you know, maybe it's not scientifically bad. Maybe it's just a really well-written article on some news website, but it's just like, um, you know, screen time is associated with essentially fucking up the young, the younger generation. Um, yeah, but I like, think there what, are lots of other. The what, problem what is there are loads of other possible co-founders. So the trend is in that direction, mm-hmm. but you don't know whether. It, well, what what about the kind of level of divorce or the level of? Um, that there are just. I'm just using that as one example, but there are yeah, so many things going on yeah, at the moment yeah. that that causally. All I'd say is from my experience, I've spoken to quite a lot of senior people in, in this space and they all kind of say, and these are people who are not influenced by tech, they're all independent kind of NHS doctors. They say the data is not there to definitively say for most of these things. And therefore, most of yeah. the research that backs those types of articles you're talking about are quite light and they're kind of they're qualitative, not quantitative from my experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Do Do you think that, as time goes on, I mean, like the impression that I get is that we're in the baby steps of of social media, of the way that tech's going. Um, do you think that as time goes on, there's going to be more rigorous studies done around um, tech and its impact on our minds? And like, do, do you see a day maybe where, you know, not necessarily like a law like will be put in place, but like some some like heavily recommended guidelines for, for all of us? around social media use tech use things like that yeah i mean i am not going to be well informed enough to give you a proper answer here i mean obviously it's an area that i'm very interested in and and i but it's very difficult because we've all gained so much as a society through the open access basically to our data you know whether it's in terms of social media um or Wikipedia, or just being able to use Amazon Prime to, like, until we start um, taking responsibility and saying, well, actually, if I want a better relationship with with the web and, and online, then I'm going to have to pay for it. Um, then it's going to be very, very difficult because the the business models don't work otherwise, and there's huge amounts of money yeah. swimming around here. Um, but I am utterly, utterly shocked at the inability of big states like the uk for example or a country like the uk who's you know one of the sixth biggest economy in the world has no it seems to have little to zero influence over these companies and has no control over them and i think but i think being trying to think kind of more macro and realistically i mean the only people who are going to make those changes are i mean we've got to look towards the us and we've got to start lobbying the us and our government needs to be stronger in saying uh, you know, we're not going to have such good relationships unless big tech sorts itself out because, and then you've obviously mm-hmm, got what's mm-hmm. going on in China and, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of you know, stuff going on and um, over there as well. So, but I think from, I think what I hope most importantly is this customer experience, the more we can make people aware um, of actually, so yes, I'm getting um, a bit of a kind of buzz every time I get um, a like or a, or whatever it is on my social media, but you know, over the month it's actually impacted my mood by X percent, then the more we can causally relate this and make this relevant to the individual so that they make that decision for themselves, then they'll stop using yeah. Facebook and Instagram so much. And that I think that's gonna be the way we do it because I don't see these governments with all their vested interests doing anything. So 
that's where tech for good and kind of the more you know from our point of view that yeah the more we can show that relation so i think it goes back to what you were saying as well like is anyone doing this kind of stuff and there are loads of wonderful organizations like the welcome trust uh, mind um like the, the data will be there i think quite soon uh, in the next five five years or so and there is a lot of money going into that space um and i think there is a lot of recognition that we need to whatever the answer we need to know what the answer is um but i i don't don't quote me on the five years and that's not really my area my kind of specialty yeah i'm with you i'm with you makes sense man um okay so taking a little bit of a detour one big question that i wanted to ask you and i'm conscious of time so i wanted to squeeze this in before we uh before we wrap things up but in in your line of work at the moment what's kind of the most common things that you've seen come through the door with patients um like what what are people in in general tending to struggle with at the moment yes i think it's really important to um just i think hopefully we've got enough time so uh, there's just a little bit of context here that's important in terms of how the nhs works so first and foremost 90 percent of mental health problems are seen by gps i.e primary care general practitioners the people you go to who close to close to you um so any kind of mild mm -hmm. to moderate anxiety depression um, any other kind of men, gen, kind of not too complex kind of and then and then it's only the ten percent that then go on to secondary mental health services, which is where a specialist i e a psychiatrist would see you and so that's the setting in which I've been seeing people for the last few years and yeah so I'm seeing the kind of the hard not the hard end but the kind of the the kind of quite difficult cases um and and it and and so I suppose the best example to give is just kind of like on, on experience in terms of working in a general adult kind of caseload. Uh, and there are two main types as a, as a secondary. So there's secondary mental health services um, does both community work and inpatient work. And those are the two main prongs. Um, and basically you will have a caseload in the community of around 30, 40 people, um, some of whom you'll who are kind of on the verge of crisis or struggling you'll see once every one you'll be in touch kind of a few times a week and then some people you might only speak to once every three to six months um but what, what you know what what i see then is it, it is does tend to be you know i'm only going to see people who are kind of relatively high risk people who've who've got suicidal in, intent for example people who are close to going into a psychotic episode and I'm trying to manage them in the community to the point that they don't have to be admitted. And then if I see them on the inpatient side, you're seeing things really bad because there are not enough inpatient beds. Um, and we only, the, the kind of threshold for admission is extremely high. So the view now, for example, on most general inpatient units is that therapy is a waste of time. We should not be funding it because people are too unwell to engage in therapy. So the whole point is, is that, they would argue that they're so unwell that the time they spend on the inpatient unit um, should just be about medication and kind of and also about kind of what's the word kind of uh, risk uh, management and a bit of kind of there are there are often kind of there's a small gym maybe on the unit or an art therapy to try and reduce stress in the immediate but there's no kind of therapy input so I don't know there's too much to say really about the patients I see but um yeah yeah i think the do you want to give me a specific question maybe mike because i'm sorry i'm going all over the place here but no it's, it's all right mate it's all right all, all i was interested in hearing is kind of um you know like we we, we all kind of theorize what what everyone's going through you know we see anxiety rates are through the roof depression rates are through the roof and all, all i kind of wanted to gain an understanding of is like what some of these most common sort of triggers are that you're seeing of, of patients that are coming in like kind of you know um like i had a mental health nurse on before who see who was seeing a lot of patients throughout covid and he was saying that obviously you know it was the stress of having to be at home all the time um that was kind of causing these people to spiral into depressive episodes and things like that lack of connection with other humans and things like that um but i understand that mm. obviously in your case things are 
probably quite quite severe um and yeah i mean i think you know the triggers are always important and i think you know in the you know what is it that, that pushes someone to that moment whether it's a mild depression or a psychotic episode or whatever it might be and you know i think probably maybe a nice place to end you know, or you know is you know when we when i talk about mental health or a mental illness i always talk about what's called the pint pot model uh so you kind of you have this pint and uh some people have it half full already because they've got biological um kind of propensity so i might have had it half full because my mother has bipolar and my grandmother committed suicide but other people had it down here but then there'll be psychological factors like were you bullied at school were you um you know were your pet fa family supportive during your education did you feel like you were living in a loving family yeah. um and then there'll be yeah. and then you might end up at over half full and then there'll be social factors so right now in your early 20s um do you have a strong loving relationship so you can turn on when you're struggling yes no no then it goes up a bit more do you have the financial kind of support so that you're not constantly worrying yeah. about money and the, and, the, and knowing that you've got six months left on your tenancy and then slowly but surely there'll be one moment at the end which might be any of those things that this nurse just said and for, for different people for different reasons that pint will overflow and that overflow will be what you experience or i experience as mental health symptoms and i think it's really I important see. as a general point to recognize that no one knows until the point that it overflows that they were even struggling you will have no you might feel a bit more stressed in the process as you go up there but you won't have had the point of reflection to realize that you weren't actually looking after your mind well it's only when you hit that crisis point and it overflows that then you start to deconstruct and think well that's how big my pint is how can i make my pint bigger so i don't have to go through that again and, and um yeah. that that's not i know it's not like a specific cases or anything like that but you know there's been a huge amount of reasons why right now the world in the developed world is is struggling um with its mind mm -hmm. covid you know has you know accentuated and made a lot of people's lives difficult it's it's broken up lots of people's routines some people's routines have got better some people's routines have got worse as a result some people are financially better off some people are financially worse off there are lots of reasons but generally it's still the same old stress factors the same old stuff that makes generally humans feel happy and tick that's working um for people and it's just the balance of those and some people are having more negativity and some people are having more positivity and yeah. i think the last point to make is don't feel responsible for that moment of crisis you were not to know uh whether you were half full or full full or whatever when you get to that point accept it recognize it ask for help and and move on doing doing more for your mind yeah that point analogy is amazing i've never heard anyone put it like that before but that completely makes sense and i i guess um from you know maybe quite a while after that pint has overflowed you can look back at that with the perspective of gratitude because you can say well that was the moment where i understand what my pint's limit was and this is how i'm going to make steps to make that pint bigger um absolutely but yeah i think that's a really good place to end the episode man um great tell us tell us a bit more about where we can find out more about mindful connect with you yeah, so yeah, just um, I think Mindful, it's just mindful.com would be a great place to start. Uh, we're on the App Store at the moment, launching an Android in a couple of months. Um, the app's really the kind of epitome of what we're trying to offer. So do check that out if you've got an Apple phone. Um, just type in Mindful on the App Store. But yeah, the, um, if you've got any questions or we've hit any nerves or anything, like feel free to get in touch with me or anyone at the Mindful team. Um, Mike, I'm sure you could you can all you can always put my email at the bottom of what you post or anything i um i'm very happy to do that i talk very openly about these things with lots of people so yeah for sure of course i'll, I'll get all your details in the description notes down below including your email man um thanks very much for taking the time to come on mate it's been a great episode cover some good points thanks a lot mike i really really enjoyed it and great keep keep going with with unbottled i think you're doing a wonderful job cheers man if you're looking to build your own mental fitness routine, journaling can be the perfect place to start, which you can find out more about right here.